Hello, everybody. Kind of an impromptu episode this afternoon. Usually Tuesdays are just for the Magdalene Manuscript. And I was out running errands. I was not planning on doing filming today. I was just going to prep for the next uh, Sophia Code installment for next week. However, 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 I have gotten a lot of emails from you guys about the doshas. And so I thought I would do just a quick little video for you guys just again to help you since I do feel like that's part of my responsibility um, to help you guys along along your path. Um, as I've said before, I've been extremely blessed in my life to be able to have some really amazing teachers. I've had some pretty shitty teachers too, but part of those amazing teachers are the teachers that um, are associated with the Ashtanga practice, as well as the opportunities that I've had in India to learn about this organic way of treating your own health. And I am so excited that you guys are interested in the doshas and learning more about the doshas, because in my opinion, and in my own experience, learning about doshas and following your dosha and working for your own dosha is going to change your life. Now, one thing that I want to reiterate, according to the Eastern philosophy of yoga, of, of, of Buddhism, of Hinduism, of all these different Eastern theories, once again, the body and the soul are two different things. However, the body is the expression of the soul. We call that the Shakti. The soul is the Shiva and the Shakti is the body or as the sutra calls them, Purusha and Prakriti. Our lives, our experiences in our body is our soul's way of learning itself. So everything that happens to you in your life is already predetermined by your soul contract in order for you to learn. And so one thing I was actually talking to Stephanie on the phone this morning about one thing we have to understand about the body before we get into the dosha system is everything within your body is in your control. And so we look at a lot of these Western religions. We look at a lot of the philosophies in medicine that is controlled by the controllers, the nefarious groups, they strip you of your right to self-heal or your right to be self-empowered. What do I mean by that? Well, religions in the West, uh, mainly Christianity, teaches you that you're nothing without Jesus. Where Yahshua taught the opposite. You're already whole. You're already complete. You were born with the Holy Spirit. We look at Western medicine. There's always something wrong, right? Like you've inherited some disease. You're kind of a slave to your body. You're a slave to the church. You're a slave to your body. Where in the East, they say, no, you, you're actually in control of your body. Everything your body does, every expression your body takes, whether that is arthritis, whether that is being a fast runner, whether that is being a swimmer, whether that is, you know, having diabetes, any of these expressions your body takes is your body's way of showing you where your psyche is imbalanced. The only way to fully heal all these diseases or these issues is to create balance. So once again, anything that's wrong with you, well, it, nothing's wrong with you. You're just wounded. It's, it's not, nothing's wrong with you, right? You're just wounded. But the Western world will tell you, oh, it's not your fault. It's just bad luck. It's just your genetics, blah, blah, blah. Where in the East, it's like, okay, now we got to fix it. Now we see what's wrong. We got to fix it. Okay. And the doshas is a great way to start with this. Now, something interesting I was talking to Stephanie about this morning that I also see as well. And I just want to put this out here before we again, get into the doshas. At this time in our lives, and maybe it's the filtered Instagrams, maybe it's all the social media, all that kind of stuff. I don't know. We have this perceived idea that we have to be perfect. No one is perfect. If you're in a human body right now, you got shit to work on. All right. I just, I'm just going to put that out there. If you had healed all your wounds, you wouldn't be in a body right now. So there's always going to be weakness that every single person is working through. 
Now, with that being said, yes, when you go into a yoga room or into a bar class or whatever, you are going to see people in that room that that you see are stronger, more flexible, more athletic. Chances are they've just been working on it longer than you have. There's no difference between you and that person except time. I hope that makes sense. Now, what I tend to see is that a beginner or somebody who might be a little bit insecure about their wounds, about their weaknesses, will come into a yoga room and will list off all of these things wrong with them to the teacher as a way to explain their perceived inadequacies, right? So we will use this label of, you know, bad knees or arthritis or whatever as an excuse for while why we're not perfect. And so therefore, it's more for us to comfort our own perceived inadequacies. And so I wanted to put that out there. I want to tell you, you're not inadequate. Yes, the teacher does need to know if you have arthritis, because we need to understand what we're working with as far as your imbalances. The person next to you is going to have a different imbalance that the teacher is going to know and work with. Okay, so we do need to know about that. But I don't want you to put some label on yourself so that you feel better because you don't look like Susie Joe over there in the corner with her leg behind her head. I hope that makes sense because you're not, you're the same as Susie Joe with the, her leg behind her head, right? You're both working through your shit. Susie Joe in the corner with her leg behind her head might, might have been doing this for longer than you, but it doesn't mean she's healed. It doesn't mean that her wounds aren't completely gone. It just means she's been digging into it for longer. And so I want you guys to understand that I want everybody watching to stop using any health issues as a reason to not do something and a way to validate why you're not going to do something. I hope that makes sense. And the last time I spoke with um, our last episode with Stephanie and Emmy, every single human body has something going on with, with it. Yes, I'm fit. Yes, I have a six pack. Yes, I can get my legs behind my head. Yes, I can do a handstand. Yes, I can do drop back stand up. Yes, I can do all these things. I've been doing it for 16 years. But on top of that, I still struggle with arthritis. I do have herniated disc. I do still do. I have a problem with my blood flow. I lose um, my, my feet will turn purple sometimes because my blood will get stuck. That's something I deal with and I have to work with. So just because you perceive somebody as, as having a pretty practice or strong or athletic does not discredit everything they've worked through. They've just been working at this for a very long time. And being a beginner, being in that place of, of just now learning this is an incredible place to be. Because in the beginning, there are many possibilities. In the end, there are only a few. So if you are starting now, there are so many possibilities to be excited about. There's so much of that to go through. Now, we also say that the beginner and the advanced student are the easiest students to teach because both the beginner and the advanced student know that they know nothing. It's the intermediate student that's the hard one to teach because the intermediate student thinks they know everything. All right. I also want to, again, reiterate if you're in your practice and you're feeling discomfort coming up in your body, that's normal and that's supposed to happen. Again, my teacher, David Greig, when he asked Guruji once, um, Guruji, is, is, is this practice supposed to be painful? And Guruji said, yes, pain is real. And when we go through a heal the nervous system, your nervous system is reacting to your thoughts and your attachments from trauma that's happened to you, whether in this life or at last life, it doesn't matter. It's just the emotion we're working with. And so, of course, your body is going to react to that emotion. Your mind is going to react to that emotion. The most important thing is you stick with it. It doesn't mean that you don't modify, right? So if you have a knee issue, if you have something flaring up, for example, tell your teacher you will modify. You will still feel the discomfort coming up and you need to sit with that and breathe through it to get the nervous system to relax as you lean into the pain. I hope that makes sense. True spirituality is not, it's not rainbows and butterflies. It's just not. It's darkness. We need that. We, I, I was doing the reading for the Magdalene Manuscript for next week, and she talks about that. Destruction is necessary. You can't have creation without destruction. 
You know, uh, we've talked a lot about the yoga fever. I still, from time to time, get the yoga fever. And the yoga fever basically means that over time, when you get into a practice and you start working on yourself, these old patterns, these old thought patterns that are in you, ingrained in you, when they start to incinerate, when they start to move and change, the body will literally create a fever, a low-grade fever to burn it away. It's called tapas. It's heat, agni, fire. This is very normal. And so what will happen sometimes is you'll wake up or you'll go to bed and you'll have like a, a low grade fever and it'll pass after a day or two and you get back on your mat. It's because your body's recalibrating. We have to remove the old patterns in order to create new patterns. Now, again, the thoughts, your thoughts come into your body. The body is the mind field. It comes into your body and creates those patterns. So that's why there has to be a physical deconstruction of those patterns to create new patterns. I hope that makes sense. Um, very common to be uncomfortable, very common to get fevers. It is hard work. Coming into your own great awakening within yourself is really hard work. And again, we have to descend into ourselves before ascension can even begin. All right, so let's talk about the doshas because this is gonna help start to inform you about your body's patterning. Now with the doshas, you were born with the doshas that you will have for the rest of your life. All right. It's like, you're not going to change doshas. So your job is to try to find balance. Now, if you are someone who's tri dosha, there are a few people I know who are tri dosha. Usually the tri dosha people are the hardest because you already have all three doshas kind of yo-yoing and you have to kind of figure out where your imbalance lies. But for most people, you're going to have two doshas, all right? You're going to have one you lead with, which is your dominant dosha, and that's usually the one that goes in balance the most. And then you're going to have your second dosha. So if you go online and take these dosha quizzes, most of the time they'll give you like one dosha. That's usually the dosha you lead with, but you also need to know your second dosha too. Now to get the full diagnosis, I do, when I teach, I do in my head diagnose my students for myself because I'm educated enough to like, for my own self to kind of know that and the reason why I do that is because that's going to inform me as a teacher on how to work with them. Right. So I'll give you an example. I'm going to use myself as an example because I've gone through um, Ayurvedic healing with the doshas. I follow the dosha diet. I'm a firm believer in the doshas. So I am Vata Pitta. So I leave, I lead with the dosha of Vata. So that means that I, um, my dominant dosha in my disposition I'm very dry. Okay. So my skin's really dry. I've never had a problem with like oily skin. Um, my, my intestines are really dry. I mean, I get my elbows. I have to put a lot of lotion on my elbows because I'm on my elbows so much in my practice. They will actually start bleeding because my skin is so dry. So I have to put a lot, a lot of uh, lotion on that. Also another thing with vatas because your organs are dry. That means that most of the time, a vata will struggle with things like constipation. And so vatas need to understand how that works. Now, um, because I lead with vata, also I'm very skinny. Vatas are very thin, wafy people. I'm probably 110 pounds. I'm just a thin person. It doesn't mean that vatas can't gain weight. When vatas do gain weight, they tend to not carry it well. Kappas carry weight really well. Vatas don't. Okay. I'm very bony. You can see how my bones jut out. Look at my wrist. My wrists are very, very small. Okay. Like child size. Like I can put my arm, my fingers around my wrist. Okay. That's Vata. Look how, you know, bony my hands are my foot, for example. So women with who are Vata and men who are Vata tend to have like small ankles. Yeah. So you can see my ankle, like what they call it, the cankle. So the cankle is usually for kappas where they have more, um, more lubricant, more, more meat around their, um, their joints. My knees are very, very knobby. I have very knobby knees. Okay. That's very, very Vata. My ribs, you can see my ribs, you can see my hip bones, very, very Vata. Okay. Um, for Vatas, as, as far as like our eating goes, so Vatas like myself tend to forget to eat. And I'm better about that now, but there have been times where I would have to have boyfriends like remind me, like, have you eaten today? And for Vatas, even though we're the ones that forget to eat the most, we're the ones who need to eat the most. So for example, when I feel hungry, the first sign of hunger for me as a Vata is I start to zone out. 
I start to lose like kind of my focus. Okay. I know now since I've studied the dosha, that's my body telling me go eat something. By the time my stomach is growling, if I ignore that, it's bad for a vata. It's bad. It's like my blood sugar has dropped. I need to desperately get something into my system. I'm probably not safe driving. So for vatas, even though we don't, we're not, I've never known a vata who's a foodie. Let's just put it that way. Most vatas are not really foodies. Um, we're the ones who need to eat the most. And so now at my age in my education, I do, I eat like five times a day. I make little kind of snacky foods. I don't, you know, five times a day. Kappas, on the other hand, the exact opposite of vatas, they are able to go real long hours without eating. So kappas, they, they hold weight easier. They're a little bit more um, grounded, a little bit more like juicier joints. Yeah. Um, as far as the personality difference between a vata and a kappa, vatas like myself, we tend to run off of our nervous system. Um, we're, vata is air. It's very cerebral. Vatas are usually highly intelligent people, but we stress out a lot, right? You think about the air, the moving up energy. And so kappas are opposite. They're grounding water into earth. Yeah. And so kappas tend to be able to go a longer time without food. They, they kind of, they can kind of settle into things. No vatas, you know, I will go 90 to nothing all day. I'm not a napper. I just work, 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 work. I go run errands. I do all these things during the day because that's the vatas energy. Yeah. Whereas kappas, it takes a little bit more motivation to get them up and get them moving. So with vatas too. So for me, food wise so food is because because the body is energy food is also energy and so i've said this before in a healthy family every every person in that family should be eating a different meal at every single meal because every person is going to have a different disposition so i'll give you an example so vata foods so foods that are also vata are foods that grow on vines and dry foods. So like lettuce, um, juices, a lot of fruits are vata. Uh, toast is vata, right? Because it's dry. Now, as a vata, I crave, I want vata foods. But if I eat vata foods, it's going to send me in a tailspin. My anxiety is going to be totally out of control. My arthritis is going to flare up. Arthritis is also a vata issue. Um, I'm going to have massive stomach problems, massive. Okay. So I have to, sometimes with the dosha eating system, you don't intuitively eat. You don't eat what you crave because Ayurveda tells us like attracts like. And so like for kappas, kappas aren't going to want the potatoes and the butter and the and all the kappa heavy foods, but that's the last thing they need too. So, so growing up for me as a vata pitta, my parents are both pitta kappa. So my mom, unknowingly, because they didn't have this education, they would make us, my sister and I are both vata pitta. My mom would make us a snack. She would make us like apples and peanut butter, like a healthy snack for your kid. It's the worst thing for a vata to eat is apples, raw apples and peanut butter. Um, I ended up in the second grade, I started waking up every night projectile vomiting. And my pediatrician sent me to a specialist because they couldn't figure out why I was like literally vomiting all night. Okay, well, now we know the doctor couldn't figure it out either. But now, now I know why, because I was being fed Vata foods, and my body was rejecting it because I had too much Vata, right? So like an apple, a raw apple is one of the worst things that I can eat. However, I can eat the apple if it's cooked. Like if it's an apple sauce, I just had some apple chips. I can do it that way. Yeah, um, there are some vata foods that I can work with, but there are vata foods that I absolutely cannot eat, like grapes. I cannot eat grapes. I love grapes, cannot eat them. My body just rejects. I cannot do it. I can't digest it. And so a lot of the digestion problems vatas face is because they're eating too much vata food. So for a vata, for me to balance my vata, the foods that I have to eat are kappa foods. So I have to look for earthy water foods like potatoes, you know, or sweet potatoes, carrots, things that are in the earth. And I have to cook them. They have to be heavily cooked. A lot of, a lot of butter, which uh, in India, they're not vegan. They're vegetarian. They're not vegan. So ghee, you know, real heavy. Like for me, French fries are awesome as a vata. I can eat a lot of French fries because that grounds me. Yeah, it grounds me. But kappa is on the opposite, the other end of the spectrum. They need the vata foods because they need to be pulled up. 
They need the juices and the salads, right? Um, and so, and so with that being said, I always say an apple a day does not keep the doctor away for every person. Food is relative. It's relative right? It depends on your dosha. Now, the third dosha is pitta, which is my second leading dosha. So pittas are fiery people. Athletes are pittas. That's why I'm that's partially why I'm athletic, right? That's why I take really fast to movement is because I'm pitta as well. That's why I have good muscle tone, right? Is because that's the pitta coming out in me. Now, pittas tend to um, lose and drop weight very easily. Like they, they roller coaster with their weight. That's something I don't do. I pretty much stay skinny. So that's very Vata of me. Um, pittas, if you have a Pitta imbalance, you need to stay away from like spicy foods, right? Spicy foods are very Pitta, fiery foods, right? You need more cooling foods, which would be more the Vata food, if that makes sense. Now, because Pitta is my second dosha, it doesn't go in balance, in balance that often. Um, the only problem with the Pitta is that it can feed into my Vata too much. What do I mean by that? So as a Vata, I can have the propensity of over-exercising, of overdoing things. And with the fire of the Pitta, breathing into the Vata, the air, that's when I have to rein in that Pitta, if that makes sense. But I'm just going to share a screen with you guys quickly, and I will put some of these up on, um, on this video as well. So again, the three doshas are vata, pitta, kapha. You even see here in this picture, they have a, a good a good analysis of what the different leading body types. So if you lead with vata, that's more like my body. Very long and very thin. Um, pittas are more like muscular. And then vatas are heavier. Now, uh, or kapha, excuse me, are heavier. Now, even though I'm vata, pitta, I do have some kapha elements. Very little, not enough to make me a tridosha. Um, the kappa elements I have are my hair. I have very thick hair. Um, that's very, very kappa. Um, my dad has very thick hair. Uh, so does my sister. My mother has very thin hair. But um, my dad still, my dad's in his like mid 60s and he still has a head full of like really thick hair. So that's very kappa. Um, I also have some mucus issues with my nose. That's kappa. Um, as far as my personality trait, I do tend to hold on to friends for a very long time. That's a personality trait of a kappa to hold on to friends for a very, very long time. So those are really the only kapha elements that, that I carry. The rest is just vata pitta. Um, if you take the yoga course that I'm going to be running with um, Emmy very soon, we'll put the dates up soon. We are going to go deeper into this and do some worksheets on this as well. Now, so I hope Emmy doesn't mind me saying this, but I don't think she does. But like Emmy is vata kapha. She's vata kapha. So she has to work on igniting the pitta, bringing fire into her, right? And vata kappas are some of the healthiest people. Vata kappas, once they get into like an exercise program, their bodies change immensely. Now, what I say with my students, so if I have a student like me that's vata, I know I can't stress that student out. So I have to come towards that student a little bit softer than I would with a kappa. With a kappa student, I have to be really, really, really strong with a kappa student. I have to yell at them. I have to get them up, get that fire moving under their ass. With the vata, they've already got that. So I have to pull it back as a teacher. Okay. Again, you guys can look on your own. I, I highly suggest. Now, for your own diagnosis, um, again, I know a lot of you guys are taking these online quizzes, which are good. Some of them are good, but they're not going to give you the full story. So what I would do if I were you, especially if you don't have an Ayurvedic doctor around you, an Ayurvedic doctor can give you a full diagnosis because they can take your pulse. Um, they'll look in your eyes. Um, they'll look at your tongue. Uh, there's other things that they can do. They're probably going to ask you about your sleeping. So as a Vata, I have a very hard time sleeping. I'm not a sleeper. Um, I try to be a sleeper, but I'm not, uh, and I have crazy nightmares. And so it's easy for me to get up because I just don't, I just don't sleep. Kappas can fall asleep whenever, wherever. That's just how I always take in my next life. I want to be Kappa. I'm so jealous of Kappas. Um, they're like potheads without, without the pot. Like that's how they are. They're just really laid back. Um, whatever type people they're there it's easy for them to relax whereas for vatas it's not so easy for us to to relax so so anyway so um so yeah if you can't find an ayurvedic doctor to talk you through this and really give you a diagnosis i was diagnosed by an ayurvedic doctor in india um i would suggest really researching this really get to know the dosha system again the three vata pitta kappa that's it and again it's kappa it's not 
I hate to even say this word because the K A P H A in South Africa is a really bad word. It's the, it's the N word. And we have to remember that the PH, because this is a Sanskrit word, it's not F. You know, in English, the PH makes the F sound, just like the TH in English is the, but in um, Sanskrit, it's not that. So it's Kapa, Kapa dosha, the Kapa dosha. So just research this. The more you research and you learn about the three different doshas, the more you're probably going to make a pretty accurate diagnosis of yourself, right? Just by looking at the body types and studying the personality types. Um, I also encourage people to um, start journaling about your food. So if you want to experiment with a dosha diet, but you're not sure what your dosha is, Every time you eat something, I want you to write down how you feel in about 30 minutes to an hour after you've had that food to eat. Um, are you bloated? Do you feel tired? Or do you feel good? Do you have energy and you feel like your stomach's digesting it? Um, reactions to food aren't just uh, digestion related. Uh, food, if, if you're imbalanced and you're eating too much of, of the energy you already carry, it can show up as anxiety. It can show up as depression. That's big with vatas. That's one of the side effects. If I eat too much vata food, I can go into a full blown panic attack. Okay. Um, it doesn't mean, so like for me, like I know one of the foods I absolutely really can't eat are grapes. I can't eat them, but I'll, I'll pay for it for a couple of days afterwards. But I love watermelon and watermelon is, is definitely a vata food. But if I want to have some watermelon, especially in the summertime, I just work around it. Like I plan it. So for the day before I get the watermelon, that whole day, I'll just, I'll just eat all cup of foods and then I'll have a little watermelon and, you know, it might spike my vata a little bit, but if I learn how to manage it, then I can manage it. Right. It doesn't mean that you can't ever eat the, these foods. It just means you have to understand the energy that these foods provide. And so you become the alchemist, you become your own doctor of sin, like, of sorts, right? I know for me, even though I don't crave baked potatoes or, or baked um, sweet potatoes, that's one of the perfect foods for me as, as a vata. If I cook it and I make it very, very heavy and very cooked, that will make me feel good. I feel better after I eat it because I feel grounded. My vata gets pulled back down a little bit. Yeah. You know, and, um, and that's just, that's just one of the benefits of, of, of following the dosha diet. You also start to understand yourself and your practice more. I think I, you guys heard me say like as a Vata in the last episode with, um, Emmy and Stephanie. Yeah. People will say, Oh, well, you're skinny. You wouldn't understand because you don't have extra weight. Well, Vatas have their own problems. We, we tend to stretch into our ligaments and our, and our tendons, not in our joints, our muscles. And so I have to be careful about that. I hyperextend. What does hyperextension look like? This is an incredibly, an incredible Vata trait. So this is hyperextension. You see how my elbow is kind of going this way? For me, that feels straight, but I have to put a little bend in it to make it straight. My knee does the same thing. My knee hyperextends, it hyperextends out. So I have to make sure that I've constantly got a little bit of a bend in it to keep a straight line. Yeah, because that's bad. Hyperextension is bad and that's a Vata quality. So I have to be very aware of that. I have to be very aware of that in my practice and in my life because that's Vata. In my, I have the propensity to go there because that's my dosha I lead with. Now, again, we have three um, different elements throughout our life. I think we've spoken about this before. So when I was a child, I was born Vata Pitta. But like all children, from the time you're born to puberty, you're in your Kappa stages. So the Kappa stage. So it's like you're cocooning. You know, it's like, that's why kids have like puppy fat, you know, little baby fat, baby chubby hands. They're cocooning. That's why kids are really kind and sweet sometimes. And like, whenever we want to get along, they're cocooning. Once we go through puberty, for girls, that's when you start your period. For boys, I, I don't know when your voice changes. <laughs> Not a boy. So we have a very defining marker for girls is when you start your period, you enter into your Pitta stage. So from puberty until for women, menopause for men, I don't know your midlife crisis. I don't know. That whole stage of life is your Pitta stage. So I'm in my Pitta stage. Most of you watching right now are in your Pitta stage. That's your fire stage. So you think about that from, from puberty to menopause for women, especially since I'm a woman, that's how I'll address it. You know, one of my Ayurvedic teachers said, there's nothing scarier than a mom in a minivan. You know, she's out there, she's getting her kids together. She's 
building our nest, you know, for men, women too, but societally, you know, culturally, mostly men are building their, their income, they're building their house, they're providing for their family, they're preparing their kids' college fund, they're doing all that stuff, right? That's the pit to stage. Then once you go into menopause or for men, I, I don't know what that is for you, your marker, you go into your Vata stage. So the last part of our life is our Vata stage. We're cerebral. We'll, we're thinking more about spirituality. We're thinking more about the afterlife. We're retired. We're starting to garden more, right? That's the Vata time. Now for me as a Vata Pitta, what that means is that when I enter into the Vata stage of life, I already have arthritis. So I'm going to have to be really careful at that stage of life. If your Pitta and your Pitta goes unbalanced and you're in the Pitta stage right now, you're really going to have to watch out for that fire. Kappa, if you were born Kappa and you were in Kappa stage as a kid, chances are you probably were the chubby kid in class. Doesn't mean that you stayed the chubby kid, but you were in that, the Kappa was meeting the Kappa, if that makes sense. There's also different times of day from two o'clock in the morning to six o'clock in the morning, which is Brahma Morta, which we spoke about. That's also the Vata time of day. Six o'clock in the morning till um, 10 o'clock in the morning is Kappa time. And so that's why it's easier for people to wake up before 6 a.m. than after 6 a.m. Because between 6 and 10, the energy of the surrounding world and you is very Kappa. So you want to stay in the bed. You don't want to get up, right? And then from 10 to 2, that's Pitta time. So that's why in some Ayurvedic schools, they'll teach you that lunch should be your biggest meal. Because that's when your stomach is really working and your fire is up and it can digest, digest, you're running, you're do, running errands, you're at work, you're picking the kids up from school. Makes sense. And then two o'clock in the afternoon to six o'clock in the evening is again, Vata time. And then six o'clock to 10 o'clock, once again in the evening is uh, Kappa time. And so that's why it's important in Ayurveda to go to bed before 10 p.m. because that's Kappa time. 10 o'clock p.m. to 2 o'clock a.m. once again is Pitta. And so if you stay up after 10 o'clock, you're going to have a really hard time going to bed because energetically it's Pitta. And a lot of times you'll notice, I had a teacher point this out, that when your kid gets sick, like say your kid gets sick and gets a stomach virus and like throws up at night, it's probably going to be around midnight. It's going to be in that window of Pitta because that's when the fire is going to start to come up for your child. Yeah. So that's just some things to think about. Once again, please, please, please just study this stuff. Find an Ayurvedic doctor if you can. Um, start looking at the different oils too. Like um, I know there's someone that keeps commenting on my thing about everyone should be cooking with coconut oil. Absolutely not. Do not do that. If you are Vata like me, cooking with coconut oil is a death sentence for you. Coconuts are Vata. Don't do it. Don't use coconut oil if you're a Vata. Instead, use almond oil. Okay. So even with cooking oils, all right, I can smell when I go into a restaurant, I can smell it if I'm going to, if it's going to hurt my stomach or not, because I can, because I can smell the oil that they're using. Yeah. So do not just follow. We're not, we're not cookie cutters of each other. We all have our own karma. We all have our own disposition. So you're going to have to find what works for you. And again, understanding the doshas is going to put you in a beginning position to start to understand what your energy is telling you. If you have a child and you're trying to feed your child healthy and your child, you're giving your child, like my mom gave me uh, apples and peanut butter and they're complaining of a stomach ache or they're crying because they don't want it. Chances are they're probably Vata and that they're telling you the truth that it's hurting their stomach. And so maybe switch it up. Maybe let them have French fries for a snack instead because that, because a, a French fries are, believe it or not for a Vata, French fries are healthier than an apple for a Vata. Okay, so start working with your children too. Now, usually I don't like to see children diagnosed until they're in their 20s um, or late teens because their body's changing so much that you can't totally tell what they're going to be until they're out of their childhood. But listen to them when they're saying something hurts their stomach. Listen to them because they might not be your dosha, right? They might not be the same dosha as you. And so the foods that you can digest and eat, the foods that make you feel good might not work for your kids. And that's okay. They're not being rude. They're not being disrespectful. They're telling you that something isn't working for them. And it probably nine times out of 10, it's probably their dosha. It's probably them feeling the energetic reaction to their dosha. All right. People have asked about meat too. Now here's my perspective on meat. I I'm a vegetarian. I have been since I was 14 years old. So for 24 years now, I've been a vegetarian. Um, I 
you know, I believe that everybody can go without meat. I do believe that. I do think that the introduction of meat into our diet does come from the controllers because I do believe that they are trying to get people hooked on um, blood basically. However, I don't judge meat eaters at all, at all. Um, most of the guys I've dated have been meat eaters. Like I, I don't, I don't judge meat eaters because, and even in the law of one, they talk about this. If you come from a culture where eating meat is normal, there's the laws of forgiveness, right? You're not held accountable for that. Um, now, if you grew up in India or a place where 80% of the world is vegetarian, then you are held accountable for that because you grew up in a culture where that wasn't acceptable. Um, you know, I, I do think everyone can go vegetarian. Um, again, I would suggest if, if that's something you want to do working with um, a nutritionist or with an Ayurvedic doctor, uh, you might not want to go cold turkey, you might want to wing yourself off of, of the meat. Um, if meat is something you absolutely think you need in your diet 100%, there are some Ayurvedic doctors that will work with you with meat because different meat does again, carry different uh, elements of vata, pitta and kapha. I don't know what those are because again, I, I haven't, that hasn't been something I've had to look into for a really long time. 14 was the last time I had meat. So, um, so yeah, so that's something you would just talk to the Ayurvedic doctor about what, what meat's going to be best for you with your disposition. I could probably guess that if you're kappa, you're probably going to be eating more fish and chicken, not uh, red meat or pork, um, and then opposite for vata, but I'm not 100% sure because again, that's not something that I deal with in my in my daily life. So you will not die of protein deficiency that I can promise you. You're good. There's more protein in beans and vegetables than there are in meat anyway. So um, it's funny. I, I always hear that with people like, how do you get your protein? And then you go to India, like my teacher, Sharat, he's in his 50s. He's never had meat. Never. It's just not done. So like, that's just such, such a cultural programming, right? But once again, I don't judge people. I, you know, I, I, my whole family eats meat. So it's actually funny. I have a butchery block. Some of you guys have probably seen it in some of my um, videos. It's in the kitchen. It's a big piece of furniture. It's a really expensive piece of furniture. And it was my grandmother's, my, my mom's parents. And out of all eight grandchildren, <laughs> Me, the vegetarian, is the one who inherited the butchery block. I think that's kind of comical. It's very karmic, isn't it? So um, it's just like basically a table now because I don't, I don't eat meat. So, so anyway, I hope that was kind of self-explanatory, or you can kind of now take it into your own direction and self-teach yourself all these books. There's great books on Ayurveda. Um, just look, just read it. No amount of information you take in is ever going to hurt you, right? As long as you keep an open mind and you can critically think and pull through the information. So this is a pretty easy topic. I feel like the more you get used to the dosha system, it, it becomes common sense. It really does. It just becomes common sense. And so, and I think even Stephanie said that like, this is such common sense. You start to just really understand it. And again, I'm going to reiterate again, keep it food journal. I'm Vata Pitta. My friend Shanti from Aquarius Rising Africa, she is also Vata Pitta, but we're different. There's something she can do as a Vata that I can't do. Like she can fast. I can't fast. I'm too Vata. She's got more Pitta in her than I do. So even, even if you're the same dosha as your friend, it's going to look a little bit different for you. So keep that food journal. Start to study how you're reacting to food. Even if you get depressed, if you notice there's something you eat, and you feel depressed afterwards, even though your body might seem to be digesting it, that depression and anxiety is your body reacting to the food too. So keep a journal, figure out what works for you. All right. If you have any more questions, just leave them down in the comment section below and I will try to answer them for you. Again, the yoga uh, course, we will be putting up the date soon. We'll go deeper into that in the yoga course as well, where I'll be giving you guys worksheets and stuff like that to really help you even hone in even more into, into what your disposition is. All right, you guys, I hope you're having a wonderful day tomorrow. The next installment of the, uh, the return of the divine Sophia, I believe by I'm a few weeks ahead. I believe that this installment is also, there'll be a link from YouTube, but I know the full episode I think is also for this week is also on rumble as well, because of some of the topics that come up in this, this next chapter. All right, you guys, I'll talk to you soon. Bye.